we can start now. Today we are going to look at anatomy of the upper limb. We have already covered the musculoskeletal system as a systemic lecture. We have also covered anatomy of the lower limb. And I remember we also covered development of the limbs. So this is the last part of the musculoskeletal series that is remaining. As we did for the lower limb, we'll also do for the upper limb where we focus on the segments of the upper limb, bones and joints of the upper limb, muscle groups of the upper limb, anatomical spaces in the upper limb, the arterial tree, the venous drainage, the major nerves, and finally, clinical anatomy of the upper limb. Of course, not to exhaust everything, but at least to highlight on the big things that I would want you to know. So we begin with the segments of the upper limb. <clears throat> the upper limb has the following segments. We have the pectoral region. The pectoral region is this part here, the, this soft tissue anterior to the chest wall where the breast usually rests. That's what we call the pectoral region. Shoulder region is this region here around the shoulder joint and also extending to the back where the scapula rests. Those two parts of the upper limb are attached parts of the upper limb. Then you have the free upper limb extending from here downwards, that's the free upper limb. So from here to there is what we call the arm. The arm is also what's known as the brachium. From the elbow joint to the wrist joint, that's what we call the forearm, which is also known as the antebrachium. And this is definitely the hand. We also agree that the hand has two surfaces. This surface of the hand is called the palm of the hand. And this surface of the hand is called the dorsum of the hand. Those are segments. We can now talk about the bones of the upper limb. For the bones of the upper limb, we agreed also that we have what we call the pectoral girdle consisting of the scapula and the bone projected here is the scapula, also called the shoulder blade. This is the acromial process of the scapula. This is the spinous process of the scapula. This is the glenoid of the scapula. This is the coracoid process of the scapula, that the scapula notch. This is the superior angle of the scapula, the inferior angle of the scapula. On this end, this is the scapula, and you can see the various parts labeled. This is a right scapula. This is a left scapula. So maybe you might not be able to superimpose everything. The other bone of the pectogadle is the clavicle, which looks like this. It has a flat end, this side, which is the acromial end of the, of the clavicle, and this rounded end, which is the sternal end of the clavicle. This is how it looks like radiologically. The bone of the arm is the humerus. This is the humerus. Head of humerus. The humerus has two necks, the anatomical neck and the surgical neck. 
this is the shaft of the humerus. And this is the region of the humerus, which articulate with the bones of the forearm. So this is what we call capitulum level nine and trochlea level eight. These are the two are called epicondyles, the lateral one and the medial epicondyle. And you can see them there. The forearm, we have the radius and the ulna. The ulna is the longer one, the one that has a notch proximally is the ulna. The radius has a rounded end proximally. So this is radius, this is ulna. But distally, the radius is the broader one. Ulna will be the round one, distally. So here, this is radius, this is ulna. This is radius, this is ulna. So even if I hide here, you should be able to tell this is radius, this is ulna. Because radius is broader distally towards the wrist. This is in a child, and that's why you're not seeing the epiphysis of the other bones. Bones of the hand. We have couple bones, metacarpal bones and phalanges. And as we agreed, the phalanges are 14, the metacarpals are five, the couple bones are eight. Remember in the foot there were seven. So these couple bones are arranged in two rows. We have a proximal row of couple bones and a distal row of couple bones. The proximal row of couple bones consists of four bones. If we start from laterally, going medially, we start the scaphoid labeled five there and lunate labeled six there. Seven is triquetral and eight is pisiform. There are two bones here superimposed on each other as you can see here. So these are the proximal rough couple bones, scaphoid, lunate, triquetral, and pisiform. Pisiform basically is a sesamoid bone. A sesamoid bone is a bone that is in the axis of a tendon. But at least the others are intact within there. Then now we have a distal row of couple bones. We start from medially going laterally. The one labeled 12 is hamet. The one labeled 11 is capitate. The one labeled 10 is trapezoid. And the one labeled 9 is trapezium. So that's a distal row of couple bones. The distal row of couple bones articulate with the metacarpals. The proximal row of couple bones articulate with the bones of the forearm, apart from pisiform, which I've told you is a sesamoid bone. It's important to know which couple bone is lateral, which couple bone is medial, which couple bone is distal, which couple bone is proximal. So those are the bones of the upper limb. Now we can talk about joints of the upper limb. With regard to joints of the upper limb, we start with the shoulder joint. 
the shoulder joint is a synovial joint of ball and socket variety. The ball of, this, of the shoulder joint is formed by the head of the humerus, which is this one. The socket of the shoulder joint is formed by the glenoid cavity of the scapula, which is this one. The glenoid itself has a margin of fibrocartilage, which we call the glenoid labrum, which depends the socket. So which movements can the shoulder joint allow? Just like the hip joint, the shoulder joint is also multi-axial. If you're multi-axial, it means you can allow movement in multiple axes. The axis of flexion and extension, the axis of adduction and abduction, the axis of rotation, they are all variable. So it does not move only in three axes. You can flex your shoulder joint in any position. You can abduct in any position. You can rotate in any position. So it's multi-axial. Now, sometimes we talk about shoulder joint proper, which is the one I've told you, which is also called the glenohumeral joint because it is formed by the glenoid and the humerus. Glenohumeral joint is the one we are calling shoulder joint proper. But there are other joints in the shoulder region. They constitute what we call the shoulder joint complex. So that when we talk of shoulder joint complex, we are referring to more than the glenohumeral joint. Yes, the glenohumeral joint will be part of it, the main joint there, but there are other joints. The joint between the acromion of the scapula and the clavicle is called acromioclavicular joint. The joint between the scapula and the thoracic wall is called scapulothoracic joint. This is basically a muscular joint. The joint between the sternum and the middle end of the clavicle is called the sternoclavicular joint. So these joints are part of what constitute the shoulder joint complex. And it's because of the presence of these many multiple joints that the upper limb is extremely mobile compared to the lower limb. You see in the lower limb, the lower limb only moves at the hip joint, but the upper limb, in addition to moving at the glenohumeral joint, it can also adjust its position on these other joints as well. It tells you the key role of the upper limb, which is prehension. Prehension is the ability to reach out and grasp So radiologically, this is how the glenohumeral joint will look like. This would be the acromioclavicular joint. The second joint is the elbow joint. The elbow joint is a synovial hinge joint. Synovial hinge means that it's a synovial joint, yes, and it moves in one axis. The joint is formed by the following structures. We have the capitulum and the trochlea, which are part of the distal humerus. Those two articulate with the head of radius and the ulnar notch. 
Now, the radial head articulate with the capitulum. So that's the radio capitular joints. Radio capitular joint. The joint between the radius and the capitulum. Radio capitular joints. Then we have the joint between the ulna notch and the trochlea. And that is the humeral ulna joints. Humerus ulna, humeral ulna joints and radio capitular joint. Those are the two joints that constitute the elbow joint. So therefore that means that elbow joint is also an example of a compound joint because there are more than two bones articulating. So having said that elbow joint is a hinge joint allowing movement only in one axis, which movement will this be? The only movement that we can think about here is of course flexion and extension. So the elbow flexes, the elbow extends. When you stretch your forearm, that means the elbow is extended. And when you bring your hand near your chest or something or near your shoulder, the elbow is flexed. This is how the elbow joint will look like radiologically from a lateral view and from an AP view. You realize that uh, the bone that projects posteriorly as a notch will be the ulna. And the one that ends at the capitulum will be the radius. So you can still tell them here this is the radius because it's ending there. This is ulna because it's going beyond. Now, this posterior projection of ulna is what we call the olecranon process of ulna. This posterior projection of ulna is what we call the olecranon process of ulna. And these projections of the humerus, we had called them lateral epicondyle and, sorry, <coughs> the medial epicondyle and the lateral epicondyle. The medial epicondyle is more prominent than the lateral epicondyle. Don't confuse them. Remember radius is lateral, so this is the lateral epicondyle. And here, ulna is medial, so this is the medial epicondyle of the humerus. This is capitulum, this is trochlea of the humerus. bones, sorry, the radio ulna joints. We have two joints which are synovial, the proximal radio ulna joint and the distal radio ulna joint. Those two are synovial joints. The variety of synovial joints that they are is pivotal. They are synovial pivotal joints. But you can also argue that we have the middle radio ulna joint. The middle radio ulna joint refers to this region here, where the two bones are joined by this connective tissue. It's fibrous connective tissue. Therefore, this is fibrous joint. And the variety of fibrous joint we can talk about here is syndesmosis. The middle radio ulna joint is syndesmosis. The proximal and the distal radio ulna joints are synovial pivotal joints. The radio ulna joints allow supination and pronation. During supination and pronation, the head of the radius rotates here. It just rotates around there. But here, the radius will ride over ulna. So radius rides over ulna distally, but here the head of radius rotates. 
which means that the axis of supination and pronation passes through the head of radius being the pivot and here passing through this part of ulna also being the pivot. That's why they're called pivotal joints. So these are the radio ulna joints radiologically. Ulna radius, this would be the radio ulna joint. The distal, the proximal one is a bit hidden there, even here it's a bit hidden and this is superimposed. The next joint is the wrist joint. The wrist joint consists of the joint between radius and carpal bones. We call that the radiocarpal joint. Then we're talking about the joints between the carpal bones, like here, that's scaphoid. This is lunate. So that is scaphoid lunate joint. This is lunate, this is triquetral. So that's the lunotraquetral joints. So anyway, you don't have to know their intrinsic names, just call them intercarpal joints, the joints between carpal bones. So we have joints between carpal bones, like even between the proximal and the distal row of carpal bones, we have joints there. Then we have the joints between carpal bones and the metacarpal bones. We call those ones carpal metacarpal joints. All those joints constitute the wrist region. So there are many joints at the wrist. So which movements will your wrist joint allow? Your wrist joint can allow flexion and extension, but your wrist joint can also allow ulnar deviation and radial deviation. In our earlier introductory lectures, we defined those movements. We define what ulnar deviation is. We define what radio deviation is. So basically those are the joints of the upper limb. And uh, I want to ask you a question now. The question will come on your screen as a poll. So you have one minute for that question. You already have it on your screen. Answer it on the poll. I'll stop it now. So in this question, I was just testing whether you're understanding what I told you by which couple bones are proximal, which couple bones are distal, which couple bones are lateral, which couple bones are medial, basically. Well, majority have gotten it right. Now we talk about muscle groups of the upper limb. The first muscle group I want us to talk about are the pectoral muscles. The pectoral muscles are muscles which are in the pectoral region. Here there are two muscles. This pectoral is major and pectoralis minor. Only two muscles are in that pectoral region. 
pectoralis major and pectoralis minor. These two muscles act on the shoulder joint. They cause flexion at the glenohumeral joint, but they also cause protraction of the scapula. They pull the scapula towards the front. Then specifically pectoralis major flexes the glenohumeral joint and pectoralis minor protracts the scapula. These two muscles are innervated by the pectoral nerves. Pectoral nerves are branches of the brachial plexus. The brachial plexus is the nerve plexus that supplies the upper limb. The same way the lumbosacral plexus was the nerve plexus supplying the lower limb. So remember that the breast usually rests now on the pectoralis major. We then talk about what we call the rotator cuff muscles. This is the second group of muscles we're talking about. The rotator cuff muscles are muscles that form a sheath around the head of the humerus. They form a sheath around the head of the humerus. There are four muscles and these ones, you have to know them. There's one above the spine of the scapula, so we call it supraspinatus. There's one in below the spine of the scapula so we call it infraspinatus. The one below infraspinatus is small and rounded, so we call it teres minor. Then lastly, there's another one in the subscapular fossa, so we call it subscapularis. The rotator cuff muscle consists of those four muscles. They form a sheath around the head of the humerus. And so because they form a sheath around the head of the humerus, they contribute significantly to shoulder joint stability. They contribute significantly to the stability of the shoulder. Now you realize the glenoid joint, the glenoid cavity is very shallow and the head of the humerus is very big. That means that there is no congruency of articulation at the shoulder. If you compare that with the hip joint where the acetabulum is very deep and can accommodate a big part of the head of femur for the shoulder joint, the head of the humerus is very big actually. So it cannot be accommodated by the glenoid, which is very small and shallow. The aim here is to increase the mobility of the shoulder joint, true. And that is why there is no congruency, but it comes as a compromise on stability. But now to ensure that uh, at least the joint is still stable, the glenohumeral joint is surrounded by these four muscles. Now, it means that these muscles are the ones that provide stability to the shoulder and actually they're the key stabilizers of the shoulder joint. But that still also makes the shoulder joint be really mobile. If you're being stabilized by muscles, remember muscles are dynamic as opposed to bones and ligaments, which are static. So in as much as there's still ligamentous stability factors and bony stability factors of the glenohumeral joint, 
the key stability factors are the rotator calf muscles. These muscles are supplied by many different nerves and they perform different actions. There are those that will cause abduction, there are those that will cause rotation, media rotation, there are those that will cause lateral rotation. So we don't call them rotator cuff because they rotate. We call them rotator cuff because they surround the head of the humerus. Apart from rotator cuff, there's also another muscle that usually covers the shoulder region superficially now, and that would be the deltoid muscle. You still need to know about the deltoid muscle in as much as it is not part of the rotator cuff. The deltoid muscle is the one you'll be covering around here, and you'll be using it a lot for intermuscular injection, again, because it's a bit bulky. And uh, the shoulder region is a region of easy access The third, the third muscle group of the upper limb I want us to talk about are muscles of the arm. The arm has two compartments, the anterior compartment and the posterior compartment. Now you're familiar with muscle compartments having talked about compartments in the lower limb. So in the upper limb, the arm has only two compartments. These two compartments are separated by intermuscular septa, just like in the lower limb where we have intermuscular septa. If you are going to divide the arm into two compartments, you'll just need two intermuscular septum, a medial and a lateral intermuscular septum. So the medial and the lateral intermuscular septa divide the muscles of the arm into two compartments. The muscles of the anterior arm and the muscles of the posterior arm. The muscles of the anterior arm compartment consists of three muscles. You don't have to remember their names, but you've come across them. Okay, at least one of them. You've been hearing about biceps several times. So the correct name is biceps brachii. To distinguish it with the biceps femoris of the lower limb. So this is biceps brachii. There are two other muscles which belong in this group. You don't have to really remember them. But importantly, what do these two muscles, what do, does this group of muscles do? This group of muscles are the ones that flex the elbow joint. And so we call the anterior arm muscles, the flexor compartment. The nerve that supplies the muscles of the anterior arm is called the musculocutaneous nerve. It means that that nerve supply muscles and then will also supply some skin. Musculocutaneous nerve. Musculocutaneous nerve is a branch of the brachial plexus as well. Posterior arm muscles consist of only one muscle, but that muscle has three heads. So we call it triceps brachii. So this is the posterior arm muscle, the triceps brachii. What does it do? But the muscle actions you can even be working out with yourself if you know where the muscle is located. So if you have a muscle behind your arm, if that muscle pulls on the olecranon, it will definitely extend the elbow joint. 
And for that reason, the posterior arm muscles are considered the extensor compartment of the arm. The muscles of the posterior arm, this muscle, the posterior arm, is innervated by the radial nerve. The radial nerve is also a branch of the brachial plexus. We go down to the forearm. We also have two muscular compartments in the forearm, the anterior and the posterior forearm. The anterior forearm consists of eight muscles. I will not give you any of their names. There are those that are considered superficial, five of them. And there are those that are considered deep, three of them. The superficial ones at least have their origin on the humerus. So they cross the elbow. The deep ones don't have their origin in the elbow. So they don't cross. Okay. What do they do? The ones that cross the elbow will cause flexion at the elbow. But they are not the primary elbow flexors. They are the accessory elbow flexors. Then there are those that cross the wrist joint. So they'll flex the wrist joint. There are a few that will reach the fingers. They will flex the fingers. So in general, muscles of the anterior arm flex. And so we call this the flexor compartment of the forearm. The muscles of the flexor compartment, the forearm, are innervated by median nerve mostly. These the two muscles which will not receive median nerve innervation, but the rest are innervated by median nerve. So the key nerve of the flexor forearm is median nerve. Muscles of the posterior forearm are 12 in total. These 12 are also divided into two. We have superficial and deep. Seven are superficial. Those superficial ones at least have their origin in the elbow. Sorry, in the humerus. Now, what I forgot to tell you, see for the anterior forearm, we say that the superficial ones originate from the humerus, specifically on the medial aspect, the medial epicondyl region. For the posterior arm muscles, which originate from the humerus, they'll come from the lateral aspect. So around the lateral epicondyle. Those are the superficial ones, there are seven. Then we have five, which are deep. A total of 12. They extend the elbow. Again, they're not the primary extensors of the elbow, they are accessory elbow extensors. The primary elbow extensor we've mentioned is the triceps. Apart from extending the elbow, they'll also extend the wrist. Of course, not all of them extend the wrist, but yeah, in total, they generally extend the wrist. And again, there's some that will reach the fingers, so they'll extend the fingers. They'll extend the digits. These muscles, are innervated by branches of the radial nerve. So because 
the posterior arm muscles extend. We call the posterior compartment of the forearm the extensor compartment of the forearm. Now we can look at muscle groups of the hand. Before we talk about muscle groups of the hand, let me tell you something here. And you can even look at your hand. You'll see there's a bump here and there's a bump here and here is a depression. This bump near the thumb is called the thinner eminence. This bump in alignment with the little digit is called the hypothena eminence. So you have thinner eminence and hypothena eminence. Those eminences are present because there are some muscles deep to them. I will not tell you the names of the muscles, but I'll give you the grouping name of the muscles. So here, the thinner eminence is present because we have muscles there, which we call the thinner muscles. So that's one group, thinner muscles or muscles of the thinner eminence. The thinner muscles are muscles which act on the thumb and they cause opposition on the thumb. Remember opposition is when this digit moves towards any of the other four digits. Thinner muscles cause opposition of the thumb. These thinner muscles are innervated by the median nerve. They are innervated by the median nerve. The second category of muscles in the hand are the hypothena muscles. Hypothena muscles act on the small finger and they cause opposition of the small finger. So they're the ones that make this finger to move towards this one. They cause opposition of the small finger, hypothena muscles. Those ones are innervated by the ulna nerve The third category of muscles of the hand are called the interossi muscles. We call them interossi because they are found between bones. So we have the first interosseous, second interosseous, third interosseous, fourth interosseous. And these interossi muscles are even in two groups. There are those ones which are found dorsally. So you call them dorsal interossei. There are those ones which are found towards the palmar side, the palmar interossei. In general, the interossei muscles are the ones which adduct and abduct the fingers. For example, look at this hand. The fingers are apart. They are abducted. Look at these fingers on this other side. The fingers are closer together. They are adducted. This is to abduct the fingers. And this is to adduct the fingers. So finger adduction and abduction is done by the interossi muscles. Generally, we usually say pad dab. P A D pad D A B dab. It simply means palma interosse adduct, that is pad 
dorsal interossei abduct, that is dub. So you say pad dub. The interossei muscles adduct and abduct, but which interossei adduct? The palmar ones. Which interossei abduct? The dorsal ones. The interossei muscles are all innervated by the ulna nerve. The last category of muscles of the hand are what we call lumbricals. This is a spelling of lumbricals. Lumbricals arise from tendons of some muscles in the palm. But they insert on the digits. They attach in such a way that they cause flexion of the metacarpophalangeal joints, but extend the interphalangeal joints. They cause flexion of metacarpophalangeal joints but extend the interphalangeal joints. So here, this is the metacarpophalangeal joints, these ones. And these ones are the interphalangeal joints. So lumbricals flex these joints, but extend these ones. So basically they do this. This is flexion of metacarpophalangeal joint. And uh, I've stretched the interphalangeal joint. That's extension. Lumbricals are innervated by both ulna and the median nerves. Ulna nerves innervate the first, the medial lumbricals. And then median nerve innervates the lateral lumbricals. There are four lumbricals to these two and to these two. So the lumbricals to these two fingers, medial lumbricals, receive ulna innervation. And the lumbricals to these two receive median nerve innervation. If you injure a lumbrical, you'll have your fingers looking like this. And that's what we call clawing, claw hand. We'll see that shortly when you look at the nerves of the lower of the upper limb. So, in summary, I've talked about four muscle groups in the hand: muscles of the thinner eminence, muscles of the hypothenar eminence, the interossei, and lastly, the lumbricals. So you realize even though the hand is small, there are many muscles there. Maybe I didn't even give you the numbers. The thinner muscles are three. Hypothenar muscles are three. The interossei are seven. The lumbricals are four. All right. I think I can give you a break. If there's a question, you can put on the chat. When I come back, we start with it. I guess we can proceed with the class. So we're now going to talk about the arterial tree of the upper limb. Now let's follow this. From the heart, we have a big artery that we are calling the aorta. The aorta usually goes up. The part of the aorta that goes up is called the ascending aorta. Then it turns. The part of the aorta that turns is called the arc of the aorta. Then it goes down. And the part going down is called the descending out. So you have ascending arc and descending aorta. 
the arc of the aorta has three branches. The first branch of the arc of the aorta is called the brachiocephalic trunk. This brachiocephalic trunk is called so because it has two big arteries, or at least it supplies two territories. One of its branches is the subclavian artery, which goes to the upper limb and that addresses the brachial part. The other one is the right common carotid artery, which goes to the head region and that addresses the cephalic part. So that's why we call it brachiocephalic. The one that, <clears throat> the one that goes to the upper limb, subclavian. The one that goes to the head, common carotid. But remember, this is for the right arteries. The second branch of the arc of the aorta is left common carotid artery, which goes to the head region. The third branch of the arc of the aorta is the left subclavian artery, which goes to the left upper limb. So what am I saying here? The subclavian artery is the artery of the upper limb, but they arise differently. The right subclavian artery has a common stem with the right common carotid artery from the arc of the outer. They have a common stem. The left subclavian artery arises directly from the arc of the outer. The same as the left common carotid artery arising directly from the arc of the outer. The common carotids go to the head region. So those are not our interest today. The subclavian arteries are our interest today. Right subclavian come from brachiocephalic trunk, which is a branch of the outer. Left subclavian come from the outer directly. The subclavian artery is the artery of the upper limb. Why do we call them subclavian? Because they are behind the clavicle. So basically you cannot feel them because they are overlain by the clavicle. But the subclavian artery, after it has gone beyond the first rib, the subclavian artery changes its name from being called subclavian artery to being called the axillary artery. So when the artery reaches this region, which we call the axilla, then we call it axillary artery. The same artery from subclavian, it has changed name now to axillary. From axillary, when the artery reaches the arm, it changes name again. You call it the brachial artery. So this is the brachial artery. The artery of the arm is called the brachial artery. Let's follow that down. So this is the brachial artery. <clears throat> the brachial artery has a branch which supply muscles of the arm. That branch is called the profunda brachii artery that supply muscles of the arm. Then the artery itself continues down up to anterior to the elbow joint there, where it will divide into two. Those two terminal branches of the brachial artery are the radial artery, which goes laterally, 
and alna artery which goes medially even though you have two arteries both in the anterior forearm when these arteries reach the hand they communicate again <clears throat> the term given to communication of arteries is anastomosis so the radial and the ulnar arteries anastomose in the hand the anastomosis of the two arteries is what we call the palmar arterial arches. There's a superficial and a deep palmar arterial arch. Right, from the palmar arterial arches, we now have arteries which supply the digits. So you can call them digital arteries. So what's the clinical importance of the arterial tree of the upper limb? We can talk about the fact that uh, these are the ones that we commonly use when you want to take, when you want to measure your blood pressure. You know that we usually put the blood pressure cuff here in the arm. Basically, you're targeting at the brachial artery. You can talk about us using these arteries to take pulses of patients. So you take pulses when you want to estimate the heart rate of somebody. You put your hand and you feel the pulsation of an artery. Great. Remember those two. You can also add uh, radial artery can be used in dialysis dialysis patients. Usually, you cause some shunting between a vein and a radial artery for dialysis. You can just say they can be used for dialysis. I want to ask you a question. With regard to arterial pulses, so I want you to palpate yourself where you expect those arteries and tell me which one is difficult to feel. So because you're practically detuned yourself, I'll give you some <clears throat> time. Instead of one minute, I'll give you two minutes. Right, I'll close it there now. All right. Okay, majority have gotten it right. But I gave you the answer either way. I told you that uh, subclavian artery is behind the bone, it's overlain by clavicle. And that means it's difficult to feel. I told you that. Because to, to palpate is to feel. Okay, let's proceed. <clears throat> now we talk about venous drainage of the upper limb. Just like the lower limb, the upper limb also has a superficial and a deep venous system. The deep venous system follow arteries and the vessels have the same names. So nothing much to see there. Also remember that the deep veins form comitantes.
the committantes are present actually from the brachial vein downwards. Rarely will you have axillary vena committante, but the brachial veins have committantes downwards. Now let's talk about the superficial veins. The superficial vena system consists of a number of veins. I'll name three for you. We have the cephalic vein. The cephalic vein is this one. It runs laterally, crosses the elbow laterally, and goes laterally in the arm, and eventually terminates into the axillary vein. That is cephalic vein. Usually, it will start posteriorly on your the dorsum of your hand posteriorly. So if you look at the back of your hand, you might see it. Basilic vein runs medially. It's usually more prominent around here. It crosses the elbow joint on the middle aspect then runs on the middle aspect of the arm and terminate into the brachial vein. Actually, basilic vein joins with the brachial vein to now constitute the axillary vein. Then you have what you call the median cubital vein. The median cubital vein joins the sub joins the cephalic and the basilic vein. Usually it runs in front of the elbow joint. And in most cases, the drainage is from cephalic to basilic. You might have the, the opposite direction, it's okay. But in most cases, this is the pattern. So how are the superficial veins of the upper limb clinically important? This one, I want to hear from you people. How are the superficial veins of the upper limb clinically important? Anyone, you can just unmute yourself and say something. It's open. Um, I'm not sure, but can you use them for blood transfusions? Yes, you can use them for blood transfusion. That's true. Anything else? Can I say for intravascular injections? Yes, you can give them, use them for intravenous injections. Anything else? Maybe let's put it this way. We can use them to withdraw blood, either for blood samples when you want uh, a sample of blood from somebody, or when you want to someone to donate blood, you can use them to withdraw blood. You can also use them to put intravenous line now that intravenous line could be that uh, you're using it to give drugs or to give fluids or to give blood, it's okay. But also you can use them for dialysis. In dialysis, you, get, you create a shunt between the superficial veins and uh, maybe the artery, radial artery and maybe cephalic vein. You can use them to create a venous shunt for dialysis. 
So remember those three concepts. Right. I want us to talk about now the nerves of the upper limb. The nerves of the upper limb arise from segment C5 to T1 of the spinal cord. And they form what we call the brachial plexus. So what I want us to discuss is the brachial plexus. Okay, so the brachial plexus is described as having different parts. We have what we call the roots of the brachial plexus. And there are five roots. The C5 root, C6 root, C7 root, C8 root, and the T1 root. C5, C6, C7, C8, and T1. <clears throat> this root correspond with the spinal nerve roots, which come out from the different segments of the spinal cord. C5 root, C6 root, C7 root, C8 root, and T1 root. Five roots. Now, this is how the roots behave. The roots form what we call trunks. This is how the trunks are formed. The C5 root joins the C6 root to form the upper trunk of the brachial plexus. The C7 root continue on its own as the middle trunk of the brachial plexus. The C8 root joins with the T1 root to form the lower trunk of the brachial plexus. So from these five roots of the brachial plexus, we have three trunks of the brachial plexus. The upper trunk, middle trunk, and lower trunk of the brachial plexus. The roots and the trunks of the brachial plexus are found in the neck. These ones are in the neck. So we have three trunks. Now look at what's happening to each of the trunks in this image. Each trunk of the brachial plexus divides into two. And those are the ones we call divisions. Each trunk of the brachial plexus divides into two. And those are the ones we are calling divisions. The divisions are named anterior and posterior division. Anterior and posterior division. This is anterior, this is posterior division. Each trunk of the brachial plexus has two divisions, the anterior and the posterior division. <clears throat> Someone is asking uh, the bones, the cervical bones, they were only up to C7. How come now we are talking about C8? Now, these are not bones. These are nerves. For nerves, cervical segment has up to eight. For bones, cervical segment has up to seven. The reason why we have eight for nerves is because 
the first nerve goes above the atlas. Then subsequently, we name the others according below, they exit below the bone associated with them. So if you consider that um, there are seven cervical vertebrae and that there's a nerve exiting below each bone, you'll expect seven nerves, <clears throat> that is true, but there's an extra nerve that goes above the C1 vertebra. So in terms of how we name them, then the C1 will be the one above the, C, the atlas. And that's why cervical nerves are eight, but the rest thoracic will be 12, lumbar will be 12, sacral will be 12. Coccygeal, a different concept, we'll talk about it when we reach there. Okay, so we've talked about five roots which have joined to form three trunks and that each trunk has divided into two, anterior and posterior division. Now let's see, the divisions join to form cords of the brachial plexus. So which are the cords of the brachial plexus? Now see how the divisions join to form cords. The anterior division of the upper trunk joins with the anterior division of the middle trunk. And those ones form the lateral cord of the brachial plexus. So this is the lateral cord of the brachial plexus. All the posterior divisions which means there are three posterior divisions. All the posterior divisions join to form the posterior cord of the brachial plexus. So this is the posterior cord of the brachial plexus. The anterior division of the lower trunk continue on its own as the medial cord of the brachial plexus. So therefore, we have three cords of the brachial plexus. The lateral cord, the medial cord, and the posterior cord. The lateral cord is formed by anterior divisions of the upper and middle trunk. The medial cord is formed by a continuation of the anterior division of the lower trunk. The posterior cord is formed by the union of all the posterior divisions. From the cords of the brachial plexus, we have terminal branches, or we call them the nerves now, or the branches of the brachial plexus. And there are many nerves which come from these cords. The lateral cord has a total of three branches. The medial cord has a total of five branches. The posterior cord has a total of five branches. So those ones make 13. Apart from those 13 nerves, the other nerves which came out, not from the cords. There are also a total of five. And that makes the total number of nerves which come out from the brachial plexus be about 18 nerves. I don't want to teach you the 18 nerves. I want to teach you about four to five nerves. Now let's talk about those nerves. <clears throat> the nerves I'm going to teach you are these ones. The musculocutaneous, the axillary nerve, 
radial nerve, median nerve, and ulnar nerve. Only these five I'll teach you. Let's begin with the axillary nerve. So the axillary nerve is a branch of the posterior cord. This is the axillary nerve. So from the axilla, the nerve enters this space here. We can see it's a four-sided space. So we call it the quadrangular space. This is very close to the surgical neck of the humerus. The axillary nerve winds around the surgical neck of the humerus. After it has gone through the quadrangular space, it will wind around the surgical neck of the humerus. The axillary nerve supplies the deltoid muscle together with the teres minor muscle. So this is the deltoid muscle. We are now looking at the nerve posteriorly after it has come out from the quadrangular space. It goes to the deltoid muscle as well as teres minor muscle. So, any volunteer here, tell me, if I injure the axillary nerve, what do you think? Maybe this one, let me help you. Then subsequently, you will be telling me. <clears throat> now, look at deltoid muscle. This deltoid muscle is here. Told you it's covering the shoulder. Deltoid muscle is particularly important in abduction of the shoulder. So if you injure axillary nerve, it means that the deltoid muscle could be paralyzed. If the deltoid muscle is paralyzed, then it could mean therefore that you have difficulty in abduction. So you will impair shoulder abduction. If axillary nerve is injured, shoulder abduction will be limited the patient may not be able to abduct the shoulder. Also axillary nerve supply the skin over this region here. The skin over the region of the shoulder or over the deltoid muscle. That means therefore also if you injure axillary nerve, you will lose sensation arising from the skin over that deltoid muscle. So loss of sensation, the skin over deltoid is also a sign of axillary nerve injury. Inability to abduct the shoulder joint is also a sign of axillary nerve injury. The commonest place where it can be injured is the surgical neck. If a patient has fractures of the surgical neck, therefore the axillary nerve is at risk. Okay, let's talk about another nerve, musculocutaneous nerve. Musculocutaneous nerve is a branch of the lateral cord of the brachial plexus. This nerve runs in the anterior forearm, sorry, runs in the anterior compartment of the arm. And so it applies the muscles of the anterior compartment of the arm. After it has supplied the muscles of the anterior compartment of the arm, it supplies the skin of the lateral aspect of the forearm, the territory that has been shaded there. Skin of the lateral aspect of the forearm.
the commonest site of injury of musculocutaneous nerve is here, where this nerve is actually piercing through that muscle. I didn't give you the name to that muscle, and I still not wish to give you the name, but know that the musculocutaneous nerve can be pierced, can, can be compressed or entrapped by that muscle, causing its injury. So the question to you people is, if I injure the musculocutaneous nerve, what would be the clinical manifestation of that kind of injury? So anyone? One cannot flex the elbow. Very, very good. So you impair elbow flexion. Very important. Good. I'm impressed. Another manifestation apart from that? The anterior, the, the lateral side of the forearm will lose sensation. Very good. So there'll be loss of sensation on the lateral aspect of the forearm. Those are the clinical effects of injury to the musculocutaneous nerve. Remember them. The third nerve is the median nerve. Median nerve is formed from both the medial cord and the lateral cord. This is the median nerve. There's a branch from the lateral cord as well as a branch from the medial cord that join to form the median nerve. Median nerve runs in the arm together with the brachial artery. So they are just together. When the nerve reaches the elbow, it is perhaps the most medial structure anterior to the elbow. Then the nerve enters the forearm. It supplies most of the muscles of the anterior forearm. After it has supplied most of the muscles of the anterior forearm, the nerve enters through what we call the carpal tunnel. The carpal tunnel is a tunnel at the wrist. It's a fibrooseous tunnel. When I say fibrooseous, it means that uh, the tunnel is formed by both fibrous tissue as well as bony tissue, okay, bones and ligaments form the tunnel. The nerve enters through that tunnel. The carpal tunnel, we are going to talk about it shortly under anatomical spaces, but in a nutshell, is a small tunnel for passage of the tendons that come from the forearm to the hand, but the median nerve also pass with those tendons in that small tunnel. The message I'm trying to pass here is that it's a common site of injury to the median nerve. After the median nerve has passed through the carpal tunnel, it will be in the hand after which it supplies the thinner muscles. Well, I told you that it will also supply the lateral two lumbricals. After that, <clears throat> the median nerve will also supply the skin. Now, this is the territory of the skin supplied by the median nerve. The one shaded there, you can put it in your own language. But the one shaded blue is the territory of skin of the hand supplied by the median nerve. You can just say the lateral 
three and a half digits as well as pearl, including the nail beds. Lateral three and a half digits as well as the corresponding palm, including the nail beds. That's the territory of the skin supplied by the median nerve. Okay. So, what are the common sites of injury to the median nerve? So I want you to remember that median nerve can be injured at the carpal tunnel. Median nerve can also be injured when it is traversing the muscles of the forearm, this region here. Median nerve can also be injured here because I told you that it runs together with the brachial artery. So sometimes if there's a needle that is targeting the brachial vessels, it can puncture the nerve. So I want people to tell me the clinical effects of injury to the median nerve, having told you the distribution of median nerve. Anyone? It will inhibit opposition of the thumb. Right, that's true that uh, if you have injury to the median nerve, then you might have paralysis of the thinner muscles. So you can lose opposition. Anything else? It will affect the ability of the fingers to grip something. That is very true as well. If you injure the median nerve, you will paralyze the muscles of the forearm. And muscles of the forearm are the ones that cause flexion of the fingers. You need flexion of the fingers for you to have a grip. So if you injure median nerve and you have paralysis of forearm muscles, you are going to lose finger flexion. And that means you're going to lose grip. So I agree with you. Anything else? Flexion of the elbow will be lost. Okay, you may not totally lose flexion of the elbow because we agree that yes, muscles of the anterior forearm cause flexion of the elbow, but they are accessory elbow flexors. The principal elbow flexors are muscles of the anterior arm. So perhaps the correct term to use is weakness of elbow flexion rather than loss of elbow flexion. But you have the concept right. Anything else? Weakness of wrist flexion. Yes. Now for wrist flexion, you'll actually lose it completely. It will not be weak it will be lost completely because the muscles that cause flexion at the wrist, all of them are largely depending on median nerve innervation. So you're going to have loss of wrist flexion. If there's some level of wrist flexion, it will be very mild, very mild. But you have the concept right, thank you. Anything else? Something with regard to sensations? You lose sensation on the palm, the, the, the lateral three, three and a half yeah. uh, digits. Yes, you lose sensations on the palm, lateral three and a half digits. Good, now there's something I want you people to now think about with regard to median nerve injury. Um, it will depend on the level at which the nerve is injured. If the nerve is injured proximally, 
there'll be some things. Okay, if you have a proximal injury, let's say if you have to injure the nerve at this point, then you'll definitely affect everything the nerve is doing. But if you injure the nerve at this point, you will only affect whatever it was doing distally, but you'll not affect what was, it has already done proximally. So the level of nerve injury is also important. With that in mind, I'll ask you a question. It will be coming later. I thought it was here, but it will come later. Not a big deal. But have that concept in mind that the level of nerve injury also determines the spectrum of the clinical symptoms that we see. It's the same concept if, okay, for those who are familiar with the roads coming out from Nairobi, let's say you're coming out from Nairobi and you are going to, to Eldoret. If you block the Waiyaki way, then it means that you will have affected the people going to Narok, you'll have affected the people going to Naivasha, you will have affected the people going to, Na to Kisumu, in as much as you've also affected the people going to Eldoret. If you block the road at Naivasha, you will spare the people going to Narok and Kisi, but you'll still affect the people going to Kisumu and Eldoret. If you block the road at Burnt Forest, then you only affect the people going to Eldoret. You'll have spared the people going to Kisumu. So it's the same concept here with regard to nerve injuries. If you have a proximal nerve injury, you'll affect many things. If you have a distal nerve injury, you'll affect fewer things. Radio nerve is the other nerve to talk about. Radio nerve comes from the posterior cord of the brachial plexus. After it has come out from the posterior cord of the brachial plexus, the radio nerve winds around the shaft of the humerus in a region we are calling the radio groove. That radio groove is a common site of injury to the radio nerve. It can also be injured following mid-sharp fractures of the radius. Radio nerve supplies muscles of the posterior arm as well as muscles of the posterior forearm. Remember, all those are extensor compartments. Extensor compartment of the arm as well as extensor compartment of the forearm. The common sites of injury to the radio nerve are in the axilla because it tends to be the lowest nerve in the axilla. So common it could be injured by crutches. Actually, there's something called crutch palsy where you can injure the radio nerve. It can also be injured at the shaft of the humerus either by fractures of the shaft of the humerus, or for those people who go um, to drink and then come back home and uh, they find themselves sleeping on their chairs before they reach the bed. And let's say this chair has a backrest. So sometime it has been described in such kind of people where they go sit on a chair with a backrest, then put their arm on the backrest. The nerve will be compressed against the shaft of the humerus by the backrest of the chair. And remember, this is an alcoholic. Then they might not feel anything at that time. So when they wake up the following day morning, um, they'll be waking up with radio nerve injury. So if they drank on Saturday night, maybe they'll wake up that Saturday night or they'll wake up on Sunday morning with injury 
to the radio nerve. For that reason, we usually call that syndrome Saturday night palsy or Sunday morning palsy. The concept here is that you've injured radio nerve in the radio groove. You can also injure radio nerve down around the elbow. What are the effects of injuring radial nerve? Anyone? It will impair abduction and abduction of the fingers. And no, no, that's only. Will impair extension. Yes, it will impair extension. Fingers. Good, good, good. Thank you, Jemtai. So if you injure radio nerve, you lose extension. The elbow joint, you lose extension. So the elbow joint will be flexed. The wrist, you lose extension. So the wrist joint will be flexed. The term given for that deformity where you've lost wrist extension is called wrist drop. This is wrist drop. And perhaps you've seen people with this kind of forearm. That is wrist drop. They have lost wrist extension, so the wrist drops. It will also depend on the level of injury. If the radio nerve is injured proximally, then you'll also affect triceps. That means that even the elbow joint will be elbow joint extension will be compromised. But if you have a distal radio nerve injury, then perhaps you will spare extension of the elbow, but maybe you'll affect the wrist or the fingers. Let the last nerve now. The last nerve is ulna nerve. Ulna nerve is a branch of the medial cord. It passes behind the medial epicondyle of the humerus. If you've ever knocked your elbow on the table and feel some electricity running down to your little finger, that's ulnar nerve. Commonly, it's injured behind the middle epicondyle there. Ulnar nerve passes medially then, supplies two muscles in the forearm. Then at the wrist joint, it does not pass through the carpal tunnel. It's actually superficial to the tunnel. So it's not a content of the carpal tunnel. Then it enters the hand, supplies all the muscles of the hand, except the thinner muscles and the lateral two lumbricals. It will supply all the other muscles of the hand, except thinner muscles and the lateral two lumbricals. Okay. If you injure ulnar nerve, what will happen? You'll, okay, you'll tell me that later. I'll ask you a question to get to that. Let's now talk about anatomical spaces of the upper limb. <clears throat> there are three anatomical spaces that you are going to talk about. We'll talk about the axilla, the cubital fossa, and the carpal tunnel. We begin with the axilla. The image you are seeing is a dissection image. Um, I'm hoping it's not making some of you run away. So this is the upper limb. This is the neck region. This is the pectoral region. Pectoralis major has been removed, so we are seeing pectoralis minor. This region here is what we are called the axilla. The axilla is a potential space between the proximal upper limb and the trunk. 
this potential space is for passage of neurovascular structures from the neck to the upper limb. So neurovascular structures pass through this space from the neck to the upper limb. Now the axilla, you see it here, this is the armpit. This is the armpit here. So that place where you usually diggy diggy, this one here, that's the armpit. The armpit itself is not the axilla, but it's the flow of the axilla. If you are to inject a needle, go deep through your armpit, then you'll be into the axilla. It's a potential space inside between the upper limb and the trunk where neurovascular structures pass. Some of these neurovascular structures travel from the upper limb to the neck. Some of them from the neck to the upper limb. Of course, the veins will be traveling this way, the arteries and the nerves traveling that way. So what are the contents of the axilla? <clears throat> the axilla contain axillary vessels, which means the axillary artery, the axillary vein. It also contains the cords and branches of the brachial plexus. Cords and branches of the brachial plexus. I told you that the roots and the trunks of the brachial plexus are in the neck. The divisions of the brachial plexus are behind the clavicle. But the cords and branches of the brachial plexus are within the axilla. So they are here. Actually, those cords of the brachial plexus are named based on their relationship with the axillary artery. The cord that is lateral to the artery is lateral cord. Medial to the artery is medial cord. Behind the artery is posterior cord. Apart from those, we also have the axillary tail of the breast. When we are talking about the integument system, we talked about anatomy of the female breast and we say that the female breast has an extension to the axilla which we call the axillary tail of spans. There's also some fat within the axilla, just call it axillary fat. We also have lymph nodes in the axilla, call them axillary lymph nodes. So in terms of clinical relevance, the axilla is a potential site of spread of breast cancer because of the presence of the axillary lymph nodes. Remember, we mentioned that time that the axillary lymph nodes drain over 70% of the lymphatics from the breast. So if someone has breast cancer, we'll expect the axillary lymph nodes to be among the first places where those cancer cells will metastasize to. The second anatomical space I want to discuss with you is a cubital fossa. Cubital fossa is a triangular space in front of the elbow joint. <clears throat> These are the boundaries of the cubital fossa. I don't want to tell you those, the anatomical names of the boundaries, but this is the triangle. But I'm more interested in what is contained within that cubital fossa. The brachial vessels are there, which means the brachial vein. Okay, the brachial vena comitante. You can see there are two veins here, vena comitante. You have the brachial artery. You have the median nerve closely related to them, usually on the medial aspect. We have the tendon of biceps brachii. So these are the contents of the cubital fossa. I am not mentioning this one because it runs superficially. It's a superficial nerve, this one. Even that one is a superficial nerve. 
So remember those three structures. Even this one, the median qubit of n is superficial. It's not inside the space itself. So the median qubit of n usually lies on the roof. It's superficial on the roof of the qubit of fossa. What's the clinical importance of the qubit of fossa? This is perhaps where you'll be putting, a number of times you'll be putting a stethoscope if you want to hear pulsations of the brachial artery when you're taking brachial, when you're taking blood pressure of a patient. Also, we mentioned that you'll be withdrawing blood from the median cubital vein a lot or putting an intravenous line into the median cubital vein a lot of times. The last anatomical space I want us to talk about is the carpal tunnel. The carpal tunnel is a fibrooceous tunnel at the level of the wrist. The osseous components refer to the curvature of the carpal bones. The carpal bones are curved and their curvature constitute part of the tunnel. Then we have ligaments on the anterior aspect. This ligament here completes the tunnel. So this green region is the tunnel. The the couple bones are curved, and then this ligament here bridges the curvature to form the tunnel. The tunnel is for passage of the long flexor tendons. The long flexor tendons are tendons of muscles of the anterior forearm that flex the fingers. So we call them the long flexor tendons. They are long, they are flexor tendons. They're long because they're arising from the forearm as opposed to the muscles which arise from the hand that act on the fingers, those ones are short. In addition to the long flexor tendons, the carpal tunnel contains the median nerve. So, in terms of clinical relevance, you can have what you call carpal tunnel syndrome which is entrapment of median nerve within the carpal tunnel. Right, so now my question can come. In carpal tunnel syndrome, what do we really expect? Sorry, in carpal tunnel syndrome, what do we really expect? Um, so the question will come to you in form of a poll and uh, you have one minute to answer it. Okay, I'll close it there. This one you haven't done well, but let's see. So I've told you that median nerve passes through the carpal tunnel. So in carpal tunnel syndrome, you have entrapment of the median nerve. <clears throat> this question is asking you after you've entrapped median nerve within the carpal tunnel, what functions are you going to lose? Now let's debate them. Let's start from below. At least I saw people didn't choose this one, but we can explain it. <clears throat> Extension of the fingers relies on the extensor muscles 
which are innervated by radial nerve. So at least that one is intact. How about the second option, which many of you chose? So flexion of the fingers rely on activity of the flexor muscles of the forearm, which are innervated by median nerve. <clears throat> but if you have injury of median nerve at the carpal tunnel, the muscles of the flexor forearm have already received their nerve supply. So those muscles are not going to be affected by carpal tunnel syndrome. It's the concept of blocking the road at Waiyaki Way, at Naivasha, and at Burnt Forest. Yes, it is true from Westlands, the same road that goes to Narok, the same one that will go to Kisumu, and the same one that will go to Eldoret. That is true. So if you block it at Westlands, you affect all traffic. But if you affect, close it at Burnt Forest, the people who are going to Narok and Kisumu will not have a problem. Media nerve has already supplied the long flexor tendons by the time it's being compressed at the carpal tunnel. So the flexion of the fingers will be intact. Adduction of the fingers rely on ulnar nerve, the interossi. Opposition of the thumb is dependent on median nerve. And we say that after median nerve has entered the hand, it will then supply the thinner muscles. So if you have carpal tunnel syndrome, you are definitely going to affect opposition. And that's a correct response. If you affect opposition, the thumb will be adducted. The adducted thumb will look like the thumb of the apes. And so the deformity associated with median nerve injury is called ape hand deformity. Ape hand deformity is a deformity associated with median nerve injury. <clears throat> There's two deformities that I want you to go check. You'll find out what causes them. There is what we call the hand of benediction. Hand of benediction. You know, benediction like when you say, may anatomy be easy, then you say amen, something like that. Those are benedictions. Okay. Um, the other deformity I want you to go check is claw hand. What causes claw hand? What causes the hand of benediction? Right, so that marks the end of the lecture series on musculoskeletal system, both from a systemic approach as well as from a topographic approach.